Right. Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone, depending on where in the world you are. My name is Sierra, and I'm the UCD Alumni Relations Assistant. I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special UCD Festival virtual event, Global Perspectives, an interview style mini series featuring UCD alumni, academics, and friends worldwide sharing their stories, ideas, and experiences. These lively discussions will focus on international topics of interest to our global UCD community of over 300,000. Today's session about the GAA in the United States is moderated by RTE sports reporter and UCB graduate Cara Kelly. We'd like to offer an especially warm welcome to anyone tuning in from the United States, where we have about 13,400 alumni, the most of any place outside of Ireland. Today's episode is the fourth of eight Global Perspective sessions. The series reflects UCD's rising to the future strategy and its four strategic themes, creating a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering humanity. We are delighted to welcome GAA President Larry McCarthy in conversation with Mark Duncan, former director of the GAA Oral History Project. The format for this webinar will be a 30 to 35 minute conversation followed by a short Q&A and we'll aim to wrap up by the hour. Please feel free to submit questions through the conversation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will of course try to get to as many as we can. Please note that we are trialing the auto-generated transcription service of Zoom, which are currently in beta testing. Closed captioning will also be available on the recording on YouTube. So now it is my pleasure to hand it over to our moderator, Cara. Over to you. Thanks a million, Sierra. So delighted to be here this evening, and I'm delighted to be joined by Larry McCarthy and Mark Duncan, and we're here to chat about the GAA and its connections in America, in the, in the United States. Larry, of course, is the 40th Uthron Common Lucas Grail. He was elected at the 2021 GAA Congress, and he's the first ever overseas GAA uh, president, as he's a representative of, representative of New York GAA. Um, it's the first time that this has ever happened in the history of the GAA, so we're delighted to be joined by Larry here this evening. And of course, Larry moved to, to New York in 1985, and he joined the Sligo Gaelic Football Club there. He served as Secretary to New York GAA, Chairman of New York GAA, and was also Secretary of the Gaelic Park Development Committee. And inside of the GAA, Larry has been an Associate Professor at Seton Hall University, specialising in sports management, as well as sports marketing and sponsorship. And then as well, we're delighted to have Mark here. Mark Mark is an historian and is also founder and director of the Inquest Research Group and a director of Century Ireland. And of course, uh, you're also director of the GA or his former director of the GA Oral History Project, and you've acted as research editor, uh, a research editor for RT News and Current Affairs on a wide variety of programming, including election coverage. So I'm delighted to have you both here this evening. Um, I suppose to start the conversation. Um, Larry, as the newest president of the GAA, and you such strong ties with America and, and with New York GAA, you know, it was so significant for the GAA community this year that, you know, you were elected president. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your connection with New York and your journey from Ireland to New York and to now being president of the GAA? That could take a long time, Cara. Um, but in brief, I suppose, in, in 1980, I first went to America as a young teacher just out for the summer. Um, and we saw a friend of mine on the plane within an hour of landing in Kennedy when she was picked up at the airport by her boyfriend, a good friend of mine at the time. I was watching Sligo football play um, that Sunday afternoon. And essentially I've been with the club ever since, on and off because I moved around America a couple of times. And then full time I went to America in 85 to do some postgraduate work. I went there and went to New York University um, did a master's degree there um, subsequently and, and went back playing with Sligo Football Club as well at the same time. Um, and I've no hesitation in telling you that I'll walk into Seton Hall. If I was walking into Seton Hall tomorrow morning, somebody would call me professor. And it's all to do with the Sligo Football Club because um, I called Jimmy Nicholson, who was at the time the manager of the Sligo Football Club um, in the winter of 1984, 1985, said, so Jimmy, I think I'm coming over to go to college. Do you think I'd get a job that would keep me? And Jimmy said yes. And so Jimmy made me an apprentice carpenter. I wouldn't know one end of a hammer from the other, but he made me an apprentice carpenter, and I was able to fund my graduate um, tuition at New York University. Um, subsequently, I went to Ohio State, um, did a PhD there, um, and in between, I was back in and out of New York all the time. Um, 
spent a number of years in Georgia subsequent to that. And then Barbara and myself and our two children came back to what I, we would consider our American home, which would be in the Northeast. Um, and got involved again in the New York GEA. This time, thankfully, I had stopped playing. I wasn't capable of playing anymore. Um, and I got involved in the administration side, which would have been a, a fall as you know, a continuation of what I did as an undergraduate in college, um, because I was lucky enough to go to a place called Thoman College, which is now the University of Limerick. Um, and I liked being involved in administration, got involved again with Sligo, got involved with the county board, became secretary, got elected chairman, and then subsequently got onto the management committee of the GA here in, in Ireland as a trustee. Um, and then alarmingly, madly, um, surprisingly, got elected as president of the GA. <laughs> and here we are. I suppose um, Mark Larry's story is like so many people from Ireland who emigrated and I suppose made connections with GA clubs. Uh, in the United States. Um, can you tell us a little bit maybe about kind of the history of the GAA, uh, its origins, I suppose, and in America, and I suppose, on the East Coast? Yeah, and first thing I suppose to say about Larry, I think it's a hugely significant moment, not just for him personally or his family and his club over there. I think it's a hugely significant moment for the Irish diaspora uh, and their relationship with the GAA. I think it shows that you can travel abo uh, abroad and through your you can play an absolutely full part in, in the GAA uh, administration no matter what where in the world you are now I mean Larry is a flight away from Ireland there are people actually closer than Larry to Ireland who are involved in European um, units um, particularly and then in the UK even closer still you were only an hour away uh, on a flight you know and I think there'll be a lot of people perhaps in, involved in administration at the moment now having a look at over at Larry's trajectory and thinking well I can do that you know and they should be encouraged to do it I think it's a really important uh, I think it's a really important um, message to send out to them if you want to look at the the, the the GAA experience in America, it's as old, obviously, as the GAA itself. In fact, it, it, you can track it further back than that, because obviously part of aspects of Gaelic games, Hurley in particular, you know, had a, had a much longer history going, uh, you know, going back uh, to ancient times. I mean, you will find records of pre-codified versions of Hurley in New York going back to the 1780s. You will have, you will find records of games of Hurley um, in New York and Boston in the 1880s. 50s and then obviously when the GAA uh, is founded it's very in 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 Thurlis it's very quick to establish a presence in America as well so what like what is the GAA doing uh, in Ireland in its first few years it was one thing to to launch an organization it's another thing to you know to bed down an organization to set down rules and all of that sort of stuff and that's really what the GAA here is doing in 1885 it's setting down rules for hurling and football 1886 it's developing its structures the first game under uh, GAA rules in the US it takes place in Boston in 1886. I think it's really interesting to know who was actually playing. It wasn't Dorchester against Quincy. It was Kerry against Galway uh, in a football match. And uh, I think that's interesting from a, a couple of point of views. At that point, there is no inter-county competition um, in Ireland. You know, the clubs are based around... The clubs are based around parish, uh, around townland, around social networks. Um, but what you're getting in America is a, a county identity being asserted, a recreation of home abroad. And the GAA clubs over there are really following an example that has been established through the Irish Counties Associations, um, which uh, began to appear in New York in the 1840s, really uh, increased in number and significance in the late uh, 19th century. Um, so that is, uh, I, I suppose, I mean, the second, the second thing I would say about the early experience of the GAA in, in, in the States is obviously uh, anybody who has studied the history of the GAA here has heard about the invasion tour of 1888. We've just come through a pandemic where we still managed to play our All Ireland finals. The one year that is kind of absent from the GAA record books is 1888. Um, the first inter county championships were played in 1887. Um, they did not conclude, the 1887 Football and Hurling Championships did not conclude until April 18. 
88, they included just over a handful of counties that were represented in those competitions. And yet, the GAA decided it was a good idea to go to America later that year. And the idea was one to, you know, to, to take 50 of their top athletes. There were 25 hurdlers, 25 athletes. The GAA, of course, in its early incarnation, was very much involved in the promotion of athletics um, and take them over there to raise funds to resuscitate uh, the Tolgen Games. The, idea, the Tolgen Games were an ancient Celtic festival last held in the 12th century. And this, this idea had been promoted by uh, Morris Davin, um, first president of the GAA, the, pers the person who set down the rules uh, for Gaelic Games. Uh, so that, uh, that, uh, that tour ended up, you know, being grand in, uh, in ambition and being an absolute calamity um, in, uh, in reality. You know, it was intended to raise 5,000 euro. It ended up in debt and plunging the GAA into a kind of a bit of a financial crisis. Um, the crowds, they anticipated a rise in a lot of the events over there. And the, most of the events were scheduled for that northeast, for the, for the cities along the northeast coast. Never materialised, you know, outside, outside of Boston, just didn't, never materialised. I mean, there was awful weather. There was a dispute in American athletics, which meant that actually the Irish versus America, you know, the draw of an international athletics competition didn't exist. And, uh, and it also clashed with an American general election. And elections at that time, you know, they're not... They're not conducted through social media or through media. They are they are mass mass um, spectator events. You know they are hostings and they they are a counter attraction to other to to other uh, social activities that are going on as well. So it, it, effectively, the GAA was bailed out of that tour. They required four hundred and fifty pounds from Michael Davitt, their first their, the one of the founding patrons, founder of the. Uh, founder of the uh, Land League uh, to get the get the team home, and they don't all come home. There's 50 travel, at least 20 of them stay on in America. You know, they've seen America, their travel has been paid for, you know, and, and America is a land of opportunity and they're falling into this, you know, melting pot of an, an increasingly industrialized America. You know, the pop, massive population expansion in, in the second half of the 19th century. I mean, one of those who stays is a man called John Mitchell or James Mitchell, you know, from Emily and Tipperary. He, he was one of the finest athletes in the world at the time, you know. And in 1904, he, he, at age 40, he wins a bronze in the, in the Olympic Games. And he's not the only uh, person of Irish birth that wins uh, Olympic medals or from a GAA background who wins Olympic medals in the colours of America during that period. Martin Sheridan is probably the most famous of them all. James, John J. Flanagan from Kilmallock. He returns to farm in Ireland in 1911, but he's already won goals at three Olympic Games at that stage. Um, the Irish presence you see in um, boxing, obviously. You see it in baseball. At one stage, at one stage in the 1880s, um, um, you know, nearly half of all new entrants into the professional ba ba baseball leagues are, are of Irish origin. You know, one of those likes of Charlie Comiskey. He 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 sets up the Chicago White Sox, um, and uh, and the Chicago, Chicago Chicago White Sox end up actually playing in Crow Park in 1924. Uh, against the Boston Red Sox in, in a game which is played about 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's not advertised. Uh, I think it's a midweek morning. No one turns up really for it, but they are the superstars of American baseball turn up. So there's a huge Irish presence in America in the late 19th century. So it's fertile ground for the GAA to prosper. So those, those American sports like boxing, sorry, international sports like boxing, athletics, baseball becomes a means in which Irish people can assimilate into a mainstream of America. Sports like Gaelic games uh, uh, become a way in which they can preserve and maintain a strong ethnic identity and sense of community. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the early 1900s, you are routinely getting between five and 10,000 people turning up to, uh, to witness GAA matches in New York and Boston and Chicago. Yeah, that's, that's a, amazing. Um, thing just, that, just to add that, that Cornelius McGillicuddy, if there was ever a, a, an Irish name, was associated with the, the Philadelphia Phillies as a, as a manager and a famous manager for yep. many, many years around that time period as well. So, I mean, there was, I mean, there was a lot of Irish guys involved in, in baseball in particular. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to think that there were so many Irish that had such a impact on those international sports. You know, while still embedding, you know, their own, you know, national sports and kind of indigenous sports abroad as well. 
Yeah, and and you do see like I mean the you know the the effect of this rise of Gaelic games uh, is a creation of. Um, you know, an organisation like the Association for the uh, for, for the GAA in the in in, uh, in in the US, which is established in New York in 1914. You know, I, I think one writer had said like this is to America what Thurlis was to Ireland. You know, um, and the idea now you have an organisational basis upon which to kind of drive an intercity a GAA in there. I mean, it probably doesn't it doesn't realise its potential immediately because the war you know uh, intervenes. And um, that slows, uh, less than it slows, you know, emigration from Ireland because there's so many there. I mean, there's 1.9 million, by the way, Irish born people living in the States in the early 20th century. That's an extraordinary figure, Irish born. Um, uh, but what America's entry into the war in 1917 does, obviously, it, it leads to mass um, troop mobilization, you know. And uh, it, it it kind of it puts a stop to an awful lot of the, the games that are likely to take place during that period, you know. So the 1920s is really a period of rehabilitation. That's when you start seeing, you know, the context between Ireland and the US uh, increasing again. You know, there are from 1926 right up to the Second World War. And we're talking that straddles the period through the Great Depression. Wall Street crash, 1929, Great Depression, right through the 1930s. Every year, there are um, All-Ireland winning teams or top uh, uh, county teams traveling over from Ireland to America. The first one of them is Tipperary. And it's really interesting. To, if you take the Tipperary example and contrast it with the Invasion Tour, the Invasion Tour was led by the GAA. Uh, the costs were borne by the GAA. With the Tipperary um, tour in 1926, that started with a letter from one Tipperary man, a Chicago-based barrister from Holy Cross, writing to John Lahey from Boherland, who was the captain of the Ireland Ireland winning team, looking for Tipperary to come over and help uh, give a boost to Gaelic games in America, you know, uh, except they will cover all the costs. They'll cover the costs of the travel. Um, they will promote the games in America, you know, so it, it was little wonder that when they went to the Tipperary County Board, a fellow called Frank McGrath was the chairman of the North uh, Tipperary County Board at the time, and they went to the Central Council of the GAA, they were only too delighted to give them permission to go. Um, interestingly, um, they looked for permission for two civil servants to be uh, from the Irish government at the time to be let go, to, to, to be allowed to travel you know, to take leave without pay. And Ernest Blythe was the Minister for Finance in the first Free State Government, just didn't give them uh, permission to do that. It did not go down well, um, uh, either in Crow Park or in Tipperary, because they said, listen, we're not just going there to promote Gaelic games or to go on a holiday. We're there to effectively promote the nation, you know, when we, when we go abroad. That trip... Uh, that trip uh, is memorable for any number of reasons. I think one of the most memorable parts of it is that one of the travelling party, a man called Thomas Kenny from Port Row, brought a pen and paper and kept a diary of, of, of the trip. So he documents, you know, he documents the departure from Cove and they left like an army going off to war without the khaki or, the, or, or obviously the fear, but they followed behind a pipe band. March to Cove, out to out to Queens, to, out to out to out to the port of departure. There's a pipe band. There are cheering crowds. They're on board, traveling. There is music. There is dancing. There is singing. There is seasickness. There is the arrival in America, and these are people from small rural backgrounds seeing these skyscrapers for the first time. There is the welcome. They actually they 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 um. They uh, left the boat in their plane gear and were taken in a fleet of cars to New York City Hall to meet the mayor immediately. Uh, they, they arrived in New York, you know. They were fated by cardinals, by trade union leaders, by the, the top politicians in the city. And um, now they played games, obviously, as well. <laughs> they played a lot of <laughs> exhibition games along, alongside the socialising. Um, and they were far too good. The first game, they, they knocked in seven goals. Martin Kennedy, one player, scored seven goals in the polo grounds uh, in, in, in New York um, in, that, in, that first, uh, in that first game, you know, won by a cricket score. And they even travelled 
to um, to the West Coast as well. He even travelled over to San Francisco to play a game. Got a train across. Uh, Kenny Kenny writes about, and again, this is where the small farmer, you know, travelling across America and seeing the potential of America, the opportunity that America presents, because he refers to all of this open, unfenced, untenanted land uh, that exists out there, you know, um, and where there is an echo of the invasion tour is that's when they return six of the traveling party from 1926 go back out to the states right. yeah, they go back out to the states and emigrate um and to, to live their lives over there again yeah. yeah no it's um that's very interesting that's so interesting about the story about the land because i suppose that's thing people went there and they saw opportunities they couldn't see at home and i suppose you know they kept the GA, they were kind of part of keeping the GA alive then, you know, they were kind of embedded then in society there. Um, I suppose, Larry, your experience um, uh, in New York, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how the GA is structured there? I suppose, like what Mark was saying, when it became, you know, there was an actual structure there in New York to be a part of the association, it, it gave an opportunity to have a formula for clubs and for a structure for games and that to take place. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can tell you a little bit about it. I mean, Mark's comment is well made about um, clubs having county affiliations because virtually for a long, long time, every club that played in New York was named after a county. Mm. And subsequently with the creation of youth games, they became known by their parishes. So St. Barnabas or St. Raymond's, for instance, in New York, or currently Rockland, for instance, or a whole host of other ones um, that would have been around in the 50s and 60s. And they would have been differentiated by the notion that these are American clubs, um, sons and daughters, sons mostly at that stage, playing Gaelic games. Um, but they would have been, you know, involved with kids and, and bringing them up underage rather than the adult teams, which inevitably were called after the Sligos or the Tipperaries or the Waterfords of this world, you know. But yeah, that meeting in Billy Snow's Hall in 1914 created what was the Gaelic Athletic Association of America. Um, I suppose that the, there was no or very little intercity play, which you, you might have been the ambition, given the sh sheer distances that exist. And so that subsequently became our foundation, if you like to say, our foundation. I mean, we look at it as the foundation of the New York GA and whatever number of clubs were there. Um, and it, that, that notion of affiliation is interesting because even though we were, we were Gaelic Games or it was a Gaelic Games organization, it was very much later in life that they actually affiliated. And over the course of the, the time, there has been a very rocky association between the New York GA and, um, and the GA headquarters here. Um, much of that perpetuated by a guy called John Kerry O'Donnell, um, who was the owner of Gaelic Park. Um, and had the franchise there, if you like, for want of a better term, of running the bar and running the concession stands and running the gate in terms of taking the money. Um, and he shared that with the New York GA. So we weren't an independent entity owning our own grounds. We were always dependent on the relationship with him. As the ground owner on occasion, he had a rocky relationship with, with Dublin. Um, as a consequence, the institution of the New York GA had a rocky relationship um, with, the, with the New York GEA. Um, and there's many an occasion where he, you know, kept people out, um, barred teams if he didn't like them. Um, and it was very much a sort of a dictatorship. And if he wasn't in situ as a chairman or as a secretary, certainly he had plenty of acolytes who wore and would do his bidding. But interestingly, on the other side, then he was, there was a lot of money given to charity through um, Gaelic Park, because certain Sundays would be designated as days for we'll say the Cardinal Cushion Games, for instance, or would be designated for local churches or designated as, as um, Marcus suggested for the county associations. You know, so there was a bit, but that was a, that was a marketing strategy on O'Donnell's part as much as anything else, because you spent your day in Gaelic Park. Um, you went in, you know, there was games in the early afternoon. Then you had a dinner provided by the O'Donnell Kitchen. Um, and then you stayed in the bar and there was a dance afterwards. So that was your whole, day spent out there and there was thousands of people and there was many many a marriage and a relationship created um in gaelic park um over the years and even mixed marriages and I don't mean that in a disparaging sense please no please um i mean that in terms of we'll say irish people meeting some other ethnicities for instance notably italian people for instance 
but typically it was a very good place um, to socialize with other Irish people, um, you know, for many, 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 many years. And, and still is to a certain extent, a center of Irish um, social activity. Um, it, is it older generation. Yeah, is it fair to say, Larry, that it, it worked for O'Donnell when there was a steady influx of immigrants? Um, it worked that, for that, Mark when there was a steady influx of in, but it always worked for O'Donnell. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, he wasn't doing well, we'll say. Let me see, what were the bad years? Well, I, I suppose that New York could stand alone, Larry, while there was a steady influx of, of immigrants. In the 50s, yeah. there was an attempt, I think, to, to, to bring them all together and, and New York effectively stood outside of all of that because yeah. they could actually stand independent. They could stand together, yeah. But I mean, the, 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 it's easier to organize games in New York than it is in the rest of America, you know, um, by dint of the population at one level. There's a level of competition there that you don't find in other cities. Now, the rival city and the ability to do that, Mark, would obviously be Boston. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Philadelphia would struggle in terms of size. Um, a lot of the other cities would as well, you know. Um, and then you have a, a cosmopolitan Irish audience in New York that you don't typically get in some of the other cities. I mean, you know, you, you get a lot of people from Tyrone and from the north of Ireland, Philadelphia, for instance. Um, you get quite a mix from the west of Ireland in particular um, in Boston, the Galway people and the Kerry people that you've alluded to. Um, you tend to get a much, much greater mix of counties um, in, in New York than you do in other places. And that, mind you, as bring it up to date, helped me greatly um, in terms of being elected as, as president, because what I had then was a connection in an awful lot of other counties that, OK, the person in New York wasn't voting or anything like that. But he was able to say to a brother at home or to somebody at home, hey, this guy is running. He's all right. Give him a look, you know. So um, and then what we're evolving away from now in, in the last year or two, those county names. Manhattan Gales, for instance, is one of the most modern, the latest clubs to form in the New York GA. Um, and that's very much a Manhattan based, as distinct from an Irish neighborhood based club, you know, that might be affiliated with a church name or a parish name, for instance. And I suppose, as you say, moving away from us when people went first, you know, they associated themselves with their counties and that's how the clubs are kind of formed then through that and now it's expanding a little bit beyond into these kind of townlands and, and different different places but I suppose Mark you might be able to tell us a little bit about you know the, the kind of waves of immigration that have affected these different changes in GA in, in America and in New York that I suppose when Ireland really wasn't doing so good it was maybe New York's gain or the GA in America's gain. Yeah, well, I suppose, I mean, again, it goes back to, you know, the original, the original, original Irish settlers in America are the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the Ulster Scots, you know, uh, you're going back there to, you know, 17th, end of the 18th century, you know, 30% of all immigrants into America at that time were of Irish origin. Um, uh, tended to be tend to be Ulster Scots in background, but the population in America at that time was no more than three four million. Uh, at that stage, uh, they set, tend to settle in the original thirteen colonies. You know, you find them in in, in places like Pennsylvania and the Carolinas and all of that sort of stuff. That profile of um, Irish immigrant has begun to change even in, 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 in the decade or two prior to the famine, and obviously then you get that huge. Um, exodus um, uh, during the decade of uh, of the famine and then the post famine decades, you tend to get you know a steady outflow of people uh, from Ireland. You know, and they're different in profile. You know, they are they tend to be Catholic, poor, unskilled, single men and women. You know, um, but they are, as I said earlier, they are going into America that is rapidly transforming itself, you know, through industrialization, through the building of cities. And and that is where they begin to uh, that is where they begin to um, uh, establish themselves. You know, there is a problem, I, I, I suppose, um, in the early 20th century so post in the post independence years post independence post partition years you still have you still have emigration it, it it is not as great as it had previously been and then you get the second world war which provides the big kind of um uh, a, a big full stop 
to to all of the departures. Ireland is obviously neutral uh, in 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 that war. Again, what you find is a massive troop mobilisation in America. America's involved there from uh, from uh, I think it's forty one uh, during that war, and it is out of the crisis of Irish America and the um, and and the slowdown in immigration into America that you get this plea from. Um, from well, first from John Kerry O'Donnell, um, uh, and then from uh, the provincial ch uh, chairman down in Munster, um, uh, former Clare chairman Canon Hamilton, to take the 1947 All Ireland to to America. You know, and now even even at this distance, and even though that story is told so many times, it is an extraordinary. A thing to do to take an All Ireland Championships out of Ireland, you know, um, and it happened more by accident uh, than design. Um, nobody expected it. it was it was Canon Hamilton, as I said, Hamilton. Hamilton was perhaps the kind of the dominant figure in Clare GAA uh, in the first half of the twentieth century. He was a provincial cha chairman in in Munster in the in in the mid nineteen forties. He was a staunch. Um, defender of the GAA ban, fierce uh, in his uh, fierce in his um, fierce in his nationalism, and even in like in 1946, a few in the year prior to that Polo Grounds final, you know, he made a kind of a, a real stirring address to the uh, to the um, uh, to the Munster Council, you know, where he talked about you know our games being kind of the rallying cry, said we shall neither halt nor falter until the final boundary to the march of the nation has been accomplished, you know. He, he was a man, you know, he, he could turn a phrase, you know, he was a man who could, who could turn up the rhetoric. And when he made, put this motion to the Congress in, in, in 1947 that the all Ireland final would be taken um, uh, to the States, um, it, it, there was a fear that Hamilton actually might end up being humiliated uh, in the vote. You know, so a number of delegates were uh, quietly talked to by Porga Chuiv, who would have been the general secretary at the time, uh, Seamus Gardner, a future GAA president, um, uh, you know, also talked to a number of delegates and asked them to kind of support uh, support Hamilton's motion in case uh, in case he actually get hu humiliated in the vote. Um, but then he stood up to speak. And what he you know, what he said was, you know, it, it, it was so powerfully emotive. He invoked the memory of the famine you know he emoked, uh, 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 you know he invoked the plight of the of the emigrant who was exiled from the homeland and would never see Ireland again and this was an opportunity to see you know to see uh, their national games played there so it was part of he was pitching to emotions you know and you know in the wave of emotion that he kind of whipped up among the uh, Congress delegates, you know, all sorts of reason uh, went out the, went out the door, and the motion passed. And now the GAA was left with a decision of, well, now we have to deliver it, mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 they did. It was actually very, it was very successful. You know, it was very, it was a very successful event. It was again held in the Polo Grounds, uh, oh, you know, the home of the New York Giants baseball team, which is you know now a public housing. Um, building, yeah, yeah uh, development. It was kind of fell to the wrecking ball. I think it was in the sixties um, mm -hmm. that 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 it was destroyed. Uh, you would have expected, given the numbers of Irish in New York at the time, that the ground would have been filled. It wasn't. There were actually twenty thousand vacant seats, but it still turned a profit. It still turned a profit, and one of the things that came out of that was an international fund was established by the GAA, you know, a £2,000 international fund, and it reignited that kind of contact between New York and Dublin again. So you started seeing New York started participating in the national leagues, now not week in, week out national leagues, but you would have had home finals played in Ireland uh, and then the final proper they played in New York for instance for the for the team that had won the national league that's an interesting played. term mark the final proper the fi <laughs> um <laughs> that, the final was, that was technically what it was but of course that would not have been viewed as the final proper here in Ireland uh, yeah, well, it, the point is, it, it was quite strong because in, in oh, the night when you got into the 1950s, you know, I know if, uh, some of the Irish teams would have had their, um, you know, they didn't have their brushes spared because oh, in, in New York GAA began to replenish itself, in, not for anything that the GAA was doing. But simply because Ireland's the Irish economy, you know, tanked in the 1950s, you know, we lost 
anything between 400,000 and half a million people to Ireland. It's largely a flight from the land. It's not a flight from Dublin or the large towns. It's really a flight from the land. You know, Ireland is the only country in Europe outside of East Germany to, to experience a fall in population during the 1950s. You know, um, so... We, we, it, were, we were flying at that time in terms of, of the GA in New York. Yeah. Absolutely mm. flying. I mean, the 50s and the 80s were two of our most golden eras, if you like, in terms of people and participation. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. The, the, the top runs for, I mean, there is, I mean, things change in the 60s. I mean, the, the profile of the people, and I mean, Larry's, the generation of immigrant that Larry is a part of is very different it to is. the generation that would have traveled in the 1950s, because there is a crisis in Irish America in the 1970s. I mean, Irish the economy is beginning to improve in the 60s. We joined the uh, EEC yeah. in 1973. Um, Ireland begins to begins to develop, but it also that development always also coincides, coincides with changes in uh, U.S. immigration law, particularly in 1965, uh, um, and it was pioneered. It was pioneered by um, uh, under um, uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, Kennedy. regime, although it fell to a successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, to introduce it. When Johnson introduced, it, he said that this is not going to be uh, a revolutionary. Uh, Bill, this is not going to change the lives of millions of Americans, but that's exactly what it did. Um, that's exactly what it did. There's a book out. Uh, there's a book out at the moment. Uh, um, its author was on the RT History Show uh, a couple of weeks ago, so it's still available online. And it's by Ray O'Hannon, who is the editor right, of the yeah. Irish Echo in America. And you know, the the title of the book is really interesting: "Unintended Consequences." You know, um, because the purpose of that bill was to make the US immigration system fairer, like up to that point. There hadn't been an adjustment to US immigration law from the 1920s to the mid 1960s. Um, between the 20s and the 60s, almost 70% of immigrants into America were coming from Europe and coming from three principal territories. They're coming from Ireland, um, coming from the UK, they're coming from Germany. Yeah. Now there was a build up behind that of people, Poles, Italians. Um, the Asians had been locked out altogether from America uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. So this changes completely, you know, the dynamic that comes into it. And the unintended consequence is that it effectively stops the flow of Irish immigration into America. So the generation that arrives over in the 80s are largely well, they're a different profile, number one, because they, they, they have the beneficiary benef benefits of, of free, free secondary education. They are, they are better educated. They're, they're more skilled. Uh, they just don't have an outlet or an opportunity to use their skills in Ireland because the economy um, um, goes into free fall. So they end it's up... In, it's interesting that they, they were known as, at that stage, the new Irish. Yeah. The, the, the older generation of people who had come in the 50s and 60s would have regarded my group, if you like, those of us who arrived in the 80s, as the new Irish. Um, and you even hear that now today. Um, another upgrade, if you like, in terms of skills and in terms of education levels, in terms of the people who are emigrating out late, because A, for the most part, they're documented. Um, they're not living under a cloud, as a lot of people in the 80s were. Um, and their, their ambitions are to work not necessarily in Irish entities, but in global entities. And they want to work on, for the equivalent of working on Wall Street, they want to work in Manhattan, hence yeah. the development of Manhattan Gales, and people who would be living in the island of Manhattan, as distinct from, we'll say, Queens or the Bronx or any other place, you know. But they are also known as the new Irish to my generation. And they're colloquially known as, from the local wags, Irish-American wags, as the eye paddies, <laughs> right? As in carrying your iPad. Because generations were known as the paddies. These are the eye paddies in terms of, you know, what they do and where they go and stuff like that, you know? But I mean, you're, you're right. That, I mean, anytime Ireland does poorly economically, the New York GA does well and vice versa. When Ireland is, is booming, we're, we're doing poorly. And so we ended up as a, as a test case, in the, probably in the early 70s of playing 13 aside games because we didn't have the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, but that sort of thing. Can I ask you, Larry, were there tensions between your new Irish and the established Irish yeah, there? The yeah, time? there were, yeah. Um, we didn't have the same respect for the church. We didn't have the same respect for icons of Irish, or Irish institutions. 
we were dilettantes. We didn't work as hard as they did, relatively speaking, you know. Um, and we were, to a certain extent, I suppose, well, this is a ferocious generalization, at some level better educated, mm. you know, and that created a tension in and of itself, you know. Um, but we still all ended up in Gaelic Park, Mark. And we still all ended up playing playing Gaelic games, which and it was the it's the culture that brings you in. It's the fact that it's an Irish culture plus you are outside of the island of Ireland, and it's a minority culture. Yeah, and so yeah. it's it's dependent on you as the person yeah. who's there to keep it going. I mean, the GA is the dominant culture here, you know. So there's not as much a known as on you as an individual to be involved in it, you know. So I was going to kind of just make a, a point on that as well, Larry. I suppose participation in the GAA is in, in America is kind of, you know, that sort of dominant culture comes into it because you have, you know, in Ireland, there's so many pathways into playing, you know, if you're not going to play for your county, you can play for your club, you can play for out of clubs, like all the different levels, but I suppose that doesn't really exist in America. And that's one big difference that I suppose kids go off to college, they don't play GAA when they go to college and you kind of have to nearly wait for them to come back home if they do come back home to get back involved with their GAA club. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that as well, your experience in New York. Well, the, the, you do have to wait until they come back home and when they go away, they go away. I mean, they go to the other side of the country or they go... To not the, like here, uh, going home not weekend. Like here, not like going from, I'd say, somebody <laughs> in the, on the north side attending UCD or somebody on the south side, God forbid, attending DC2, for instance, you know? Um, but I mean, they go to, you know, upstate New York would be quite a popular place. So the, the notion of coming home at the weekend simply doesn't exist. But the other big issue in, in terms of the GN, and not many people realize this, is that once you leave the education system in America, the, you, you simply do not participate in adult competitive sport. It says you stop. And so when our children go off to college like that, the dominant sports culture says you don't continue to play. You do your marathons, you play tennis, you play golf, you play bar league, softball and stuff like that. But you don't continuously practice twice or three times a week, play a game at the weekend. So, yes, we do very, very well in having our children involved up until it's that time when they go off to college. If they stay locally, they will you know, probably stay involved because it, it's there for them. But the, the dominant sports culture says that young adults give up sport once they leave the education system which is a tremendous challenge here, it's the complete opposite. You know, you stay involved. You know, you have mm. guys out who probably should be retired playing 35 and 36-year-old for cooler Bs or Cs or Ds or Kilmacud 7s or something like that, you know. Um, but they're enjoying it. And it, it, it's a huge waste of talent. It's a huge waste of an experience for young people to, to do what they do in America. But that's simply the system that they have. You know, now we retain it as much as we can. It is retained in the ethnic communities to a great extent because we're used to that notion of the club culture and staying involved and participating in sport, even though, you know, we've gone well beyond our prime years in terms of participating in terms of our abilities as well, you know. So that, that's suppose, a continuous yeah, challenge. That's the thing I suppose with the GA that, you know, it is for everybody. And I suppose maybe the GA has a little bit of a niche in the market there that there is you know there's opportunities for people who maybe have left school or finished college that they can still be involved competitively in a sport yeah oh it definitely is yeah i mean it's unique in that regard in terms of of american sport and, and opportunities to participate in um in adult sport but again it's cracking that nut of the dominant sport culture which says you stop and you go and you don't do it you know that's 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 always been the challenge and i know mark um, said the other day i mean what have we got I claimed 54 million Irish Americans. You said that number was quite significantly less than that at this stage. You know, so whatever number it is, despite that, you don't see that continued involvement as adults. Yeah. It's very much left to the, the, the Irish. Those who are there. Those who are there, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's an important point because I, I do think, uh, I mean, uh, from the 70s onwards, there, there, were, there were big mistakes made by the GAA in the states because i think they had realized there was a problem with, with with the flow of immigrants and they started thinking into the 1970s about having youth programs and developed it yeah, really. and then when your generation arrived over in the 80s and they had this fresh influx it probably took 
the focus of that. I mean, I, we did, uh, one of the people we interviewed as part of the uh, GAA Oral History Project is someone you, I'm sure you know, Larry Seamus Dooley, um, uh, who had been president of the New York board. He arrived over from Monaghan in the 1970s. His interview, which is on the GAA website, is, is absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, he, he did talk about, you know, uh, there's a reason why there was friction between Dublin and New York, because... <laughs> there was an awful lot of what we would uh, regard as kind of a a core GAA values, which were being regularly flouted. You know, money was being offered to people to come over to America. There were kids who were playing with teams over there who would be set aside when an influx of inter-county players would arrive over during the summer. Mm. Um, Seamus had a great line for you. It was more to do with players coming late in the season, Mark. Late in the season, yeah. yeah. So he, 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 you would be dependent on your locals through, we'll say, April, May, June, July. And then because we were we allowed weekenders at that time, um, the weekenders would be flown in as the importance of the games ratcheted up. So when it came to the playoffs, you know, you some guy from Monaghan would be flown or an inter-county player and the local guy was sat down. And that happened consistently, I don't know. Um, Seamus that, called that it a cowboy a league at one stage. Hmm? Um, he called it a cowboy league. Oh, uh, Mr. Dooley was more no, no, no. no. <laughs> prone, prone to hyperbole and exaggeration. <laughs> um, uh, but he also then talked about later on, it was in the 2000s, so this would have been where you would have had, you know, Connery was doing very well here. Um, but what you got was, I mean, people weren't going necessarily for... Um, they weren't necessarily going out of necessity. They were going for the experience of it. Like he, he, he would have said a lot of the, the New York championships or the other, some of the other US championships resembled an Irish student's competition. Yeah, were times, yeah. But in, uh, but in fairness to the New York GA, Mark, as well, this has to be said, we stopped those weekenders a number yeah. of years ago. Mm-hmm. We, we said, listen, this is not, sitting down all our local lads is not good. Now, it, it wasn't on the cusp of a revolution, but some of the sensible people around us said, look, we've got to stop this. Yeah. Uh, and we did. Um, and we, that brought some smart. No, we still invite, not invite, we still welcome the students who come during the summer because of the whole notion of the J1 program, yeah. uh, which, is, which, is, which is, continues to be vibrant um, and which is important in an Irish context as well, that, um, that young kids, I can't say the column kids, young students from, would get an experience of a summer in America. Yeah. Um, and long may that continue, you know, but this whole notion of, of uh, Seamus, and he's right, describing the cowboys coming over. You know, we had to stop that, or at least yeah, try yeah. and put some smart down it at least. Yeah, and I, I to, to be honest with you, I think that change of focus is quite evident in some of the developments in the last 10, 20 years. I think you referred to them. We, we had this conversation recently about Rockland GAA, you know, mm-hmm. acquiring their own ground. Shannon mm-hmm. Gales undertaken a big, uh, a long-term lease on a facility in New York. The redevelopments that are taking place in Gaelic Park, you know, I think these are... These are hugely significant developments. And I, I had the pleasure a number of years ago to, to, to travel to San Francisco for the Continental Youth Championships. And both the numbers and the quality of hurling and football was as good as you'd see anywhere in the world, uh, you know, um, or sorry, anywhere in Ireland, you know, and... Um, well, anywhere and in the world will do. Anywhere in the world will do as well, yeah. Um, and... Um, well, that's what those teams in the 20s and 30s would usually come back to after beating New York would usually come back bearing the ludicrous title of world champions. Um, so, yeah, any, 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 anywhere in the world, you know, and... Um, but those CYCs just are, are, our, are our failure, essentially. You know, they're the equivalent of our failure, except they're run as a, as a festival in, in four days. And you have from under eights to under 18s drawn from all three governing bodies on the, in the continent of North America. So you not only have New York, you have USGA people there as well, and you have the Canadians as well involved, you know. So it is a complete gathering of the, of the GA clans, no matter where, it's ha- where it happens. And it does tend to happen, take place in larger metropolitan areas. Um, and it's, it's a great four days. So anybody who wants to spend, <laughs> get immersed in the American GA, go and see the CYC. Just visit it for a day because it, it's a, an, an impressive presentation. I can Absolutely. Assure. And I suppose another element of, I suppose, the New York GA is, of course, their involvement in the Connacht Championship. And I suppose that, I know, obviously, it can't happen this year and last year with um, the pandemic. But, you know, it is a great event for, for people who travel from Ireland to go to that game every year. And it's, 
you know, I've actually been to Gaelic Park to, to a New York game myself. And, you know, it, it is a brilliant event. It's supposed to bring the Irish community together and bring, I suppose, the GAA community outside of the Irish community together as well in New York. Yeah, it's a fabulous weekend. It, it is, and long may it continue. And we've been in it now 20 years. And the closest we've got to winning a match is we were, we, we got beaten an extra time twice by Leitrim, actually. Um, we came very, very close about three years ago and we scared the pants off Roscommon um, maybe the year after. Um, but look, we live in hope um, and we will long continue to participate in that championship um, because it is that great event. Um, yeah. I, I tell the story of when Sligo were out the last time, there was a lot of people in, in New York from the village of Curry, which is down near Charleston and southwest um, Sligo. Um, there was a photograph taken underneath the scoreboard in Gaelic Park of 92 people from the village of Curry in Gaelic Park in America. Now think of the collective memory of that. You know, they would never have traveled um, just, and they only traveled because of the GA event. And so that's mm -hmm. why I say, you know, we will, we will continue to struggle to put it politically correct um, in the kind of championship, but long may the event itself continue because of that sort of association and that sort of event. Um, yeah. because it is, a, it is a huge weekend for us. Can I go back to one point Mark was making about the development mm -hmm. of the, the, the impetus then as to take on from what Seamus Dooley was saying and Rockland, you were mentioning Shannon Gales, for instance. The New York Senior Football Champions at the moment are a team called St. Barnabas. Right? Every one of them was born in America. They won it last, um, last September, October. They beat a club called Sligo which I was the chairman of one stage in my life. So aside from the fact that I'm very upset that Sligo lost the senior football final, after being 10 points up at the second water break in the replay, we lost it an extra time. That aside, You're over one it. of the huge differences <laughs> was that when the final whistle blew, the amount of kids that ran onto the field to cheer their heroes, everyone born in New York, was massive. And that was great for football. Not happy it was great for Sligo, but it was great for football and it was great for the GEA in that context, you know. So that's a change as well. And that has, that's part and parcel of what happened with COVID because those J1ers couldn't travel, you know. Um, so that, that, that evolution continues. Yeah, and I suppose, I guess, that is the thing with the pandemic. It forces the game to adapt to, you know, what circumstances it's in. And, you know, it's such talking about, you know, those that event, the the kind of championship game and I suppose the the club with, you know, all the kind of New York born kids. And I suppose, Mark, you know, while it's on the other side of the Atlantic, there's such an element of identity attached to all of us with GA in America. And you know, you think of you know, like the, the All-Ireland final in 1947. I mean, that's so significant. I mean, you can't imagine now if the All-Ireland final, the final no, suddenly went, why not? not? I know, why not? <laughs> but, you know, all if these If ever there was a presidency. And, yeah. <laughs> Larry's going to make it happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I suppose all these kind of stories that we hear, you know, even I was thinking, you know, about the stories of Christy Ring playing in New York. And, you know, they're all such important stories of the GAA story for everyone all over the world, not just in New York or here in Ireland. Yeah, they are. I mean, I, I think... I mean, I'm not sure we're going back to those days of the 50s. I don't think, well, hopefully we're not going back to them here. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think we're going, I don't think New York is going to experience those either. And I think that the developments that you're seeing over there, very, very practical, very uh, ground up developments that you're seeing over there are an illustration of that. And their commitment, their commitment to, to sustain themselves from their own networks and their own communities, you know, and also and opening out the games to others, you know, that and that is, to be honest with you, that is probably the only viable uh, solution. I think in uh, prior to the prior to the last financial crash here, I think there was only 170,000 Irish born people living in the United States, Irish born living in the United States. So you know, that goes from 1.9 million back, you know, in the early uh, in the early 20th century. And, you know, the projections for our population are, are, are only going one way on this island, you know, so we're building for them to be accommodated here, which is a great thing, you know, um, and then you come back to the point of Irish America and the nature of Irish America is obviously going to change as well. I think the last, the last election was really interesting, although we're kind of, we're fixating on, on Biden and the ancestral connections with, 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 with Joseph Biden. You can see those demographic shifts in places like, you know, 
I don't know, maybe Georgia, Arizona, places like that. They were really, I think they were really um, uh, apparent in, in the last election. Some of them in some of those states, it's been apparent over a number of elections. So Irish America is perhaps going to reduce or be different uh, in the coming years. Um, there in UCD, the Clinton Institute a couple of years ago did a, a very interesting study. And, and it was a significant study. It was looking at people who would define themselves as Irish Americans. And these were all people between 18 and 30. You know, there were nearly 800 people surveyed. Um, there were about 50 of them, I think, interviewed, you know. So, so th that's a pretty good, pretty good number really interesting what emerged out of that now very few of those people 90 percent of them had no connection with an irish organization in america right and um uh, many of which they would have regarded as old and i'm uh, pr they're probably thinking about the ancient order of hibernians and groups like that you know and which uh, okay. which larry's generation probably were you know were were were, were departing from uh, as well you know but i i think that's a kind of really interesting development. The great historian Joe Lee would have always made the point that the number, the people who claim an ancestral connection to Ireland is very different to the people for whom Ireland per, per, uh, plays an active part in their own identity and in their own lives. They're two very, very different things, which is not to say they're not, that ancestral connection is not important. The hyphenated Irish are not important, but they are two very, very different things. You know, at so at some level, Mark, they're the sort of St. Patrick's Day Irish. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So people come out and celebrate that the old Irish, the, the well moneyed Irish to a certain extent, you know, will come out on, on those sort of days. But and I'm not being disparaging of it, you won't see them for the rest of the year to a certain extent. Yeah. You know, in terms of claiming their, their relationship to Ireland, you know. Yeah. Um, so the best way to experience that Irish culture is when you establish that presence and the kind of work that has been done. And it's really interesting. I, 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 I think it's important. There's probably a wider point to be made here about the relationship between GA, not, not Crow Park, actually, um, but GAA units here and American uh, organizations. And I, I think the, the relationship here is, tends to be quite exploitative. We don't actually support diaspora clubs we use america as a way to actually you know to, to go over and kind of fundraise um and um I, I, that seems to me to be uh, uh, counterproductive like there is a reason why both crow park and indeed the irish government through emigrant support programs invest in developments like rockland and shannon gales and gaelic park and substantial amounts of money too because they realize the vital role that those clubs play in uh, in the irish american community and in promoting a, a, an irish culture presence visibility uh, in, in American life uh, and you know the, the pleas have now been constant for a number of years from New York and other cities to please just leave us alone and let us invest in our own development rather than coming out and you know and, and effectively trying to asset strip us over here you know that's a very good way of putting it asset strip us yeah of, yeah lots of people do and you know th there's at, at some level some of those people who do come there's no recognition of the local effort absolutely at all uh, which even upsets the, the 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 local ga units more at least give us the recognition that we're there and we're you know we're we're of the same family if you like but um that hasn't happened with a number of institutions who've come to quote unquote asset strip <laughs> well it's, it's more of a shakedown than a help well, yeah, right. well, it's the same thing it's the same thing yeah <laughs> but i mean have, having said that we obviously we as an institution Started that in 1888, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, I suppose that's true. I, I suppose well embedded in the culture of the institution. Uh, that, that's true. I suppose what it has changed now is that the, you you do have public money going into um, developments like that. I, it seems to me, to, as I said, to be um, counterproductive um, and self defeating for Crow Park to be putting a quarter of a million into a development in New York or Boston or the Irish government to, to put some, that type of funding and then GAA units themselves to go out and extract multiples of that, um, you know, from the same cities. 
Um, I suppose just to move on then, we've a couple of little questions in, uh, they're for Larry, so I'll start here. Um, how successful are drives to recruit players in the US who are not culturally Irish or have Irish connections? Or I suppose, is there a drive or is that something that the GAA in America is looking at? Well, I mean, at, at a local level, the clubs do, do their own recruiting. So mm. it's totally up to them. As an entity, and are the GA collectively looking at this? Probably not. I mean, the, the, the essence of a GA club is you put a team out. Where are you going to get the team? You're going to recruit people to play in your team. Mm. And so it's very much, uh, you know, at a local like level. Like that. I like that. I mean, are we doing it in a global sense? Probably not. Are we cognizant that we need that we expand beyond the traditional centres of Irish immigration? Yes, we are. But how does that happen? It has to grow organically in those cities. Through the clubs, like yeah. Phoenix and Charlotte, North Carolina, for instance, and, and even Atlanta, for instance, or Columbia, South Carolina. They all have teams, but they've been grown from the ground up. Have we decided we're going to have a team in Phoenix? No. Mm. You know? um, I suppose then the second question is, um, how does Larry feel that the dispersion of modern Irish emigrants away from the traditional Irish neighbourhoods to different parts of New York are, uh, is going to affect the future of New York GAA? I suppose this is almost a bit like the Rocklands kind of example, a little bit out in the suburbs and kind of the non-traditional little parts where the Irish would tend to live. It's got, uh, well, I mean, yeah, what, what they've done is they've migrated out because they've, they're doing well financially and economically. And they've gone on to better out, in the, out into the suburbs, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So when you don't have a collective together, if you don't have a large, we we'll say, group of Irish people, it's going to make it more challenging to create clubs. But for instance, there's a hurling club up in Ulster County, for instance. Um, there are clubs. It, it means it's a lot more difficult to bring the community together. But they do exist, but it needs to be driven, again, as I say, organically. Um, it's much easier, I suppose, to do it in a place like Woodlawn um, or in Woodside, for instance, um, than it might be in some of the other neighbourhoods. But Rockland have shown the model. You know, I, I suppose it kind of comes back to that kind of adapting to the sort of change of circumstances and adapting to suppose, where people move to. Um, I suppose a final question that I would have for you, Larry, just kind of I suppose, on the whole area of kind of adapting. Um, you know, you've come in as the new president of the GAA and it's been so significant as the first overseas president, but you've also taken over in the middle of a global pandemic. So how has that been for you and your kind of first couple of months in office? Um, it's been wonderful. It's been a great job. It's been a great gig. It's been thoroughly enjoyable. Um, a good friend of mine who's the chairman of the Derry County Board texted me the other day and said, Have I, had I figured out what the remit was yet? And I went back to him and I said, listen, do you remember, um, you might be old enough to remember a singer called Dana from your part of the world. And she won the Eurovision many, many years ago. And she won it with a song called All Kinds of Everything. I said, that's the remit. <laughs> Um, and again, gave the example of last Friday morning, for instance, I was at a, an inve a national investment office seminar where I was making a contribution on, on a panel. And you had the Minister for Public, oh, Michal McGrath, I don't know what his title is uh, actually. Uh, public Expenditure. Public Expenditure and a whole load of um, civil servants and NGOs and stuff like that. And then I came out of that and had to deal with a county manager who was anxious to become a member of the NUJ for the weekend. So he could be a colour commentator at a low at a match, right? <laughs> but the, the fact that he was suspended was, you know, kind of irrelevant to the, the county manager at the time. But that's what I mean. And it's but it's been absolutely brilliant, Cara. I mean, I'm back. I'm back here now, nearly three months, and it has been a wonderful experience to be in this job. And the, the gig is all I expected it to be. I must admit. And, and I suppose it's uh, it's good to finally have the games back, that the return to play is happening and that the league started two weeks ago. You must be really being able to enjoy that now. Well, I'm not able, I am in, able to enjoy it through the, the technology of GA Go. I haven't seen a match as president of the GA yet, a live match, which is at some level alarming, but understandable given the circumstances. And we have fans coming back in the north of Ireland next week, I think on the 24th. Um, there's 500 people going to be allowed at games. So that's another step. And then hopefully by the middle of the summer, if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, um, we will have people at, at our major games. And we'll probably, hopefully, have people here in Croke Park for the All-Ireland playoffs, for the semi-finals and finals at least, you know. Um, and well, so, hopefully. As we said, the more, at that stage, the more the merrier that are in here. Because <laughs> the cupboard is rather bare. 
It is. It definitely is. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for joining us this evening, to Mark and to Larry. And I'll hand you back now to Sierra. Thanks so much. Yeah, big thank you, um, Cara, Larry, Mark, for such a great conversation. Um, you've been absolutely fantastic and a wealth of knowledge there. Um, you'll be happy to know that uh, when I was eight, I did play a summer of Gaelic football myself in San Francisco with my then neighbors from Cary. So I was one of those kids kicking it on the field as well. Good. Uh, before we wrap up, this is just a reminder that you can register for our other Global Perspective events um, and see the full UCD Festival lineup by clicking the link that should be showing up in your chat box shortly. The main UCD Festival is happening online from the 27th to the 29th of May, and it features really interesting and exciting conversations, performances, workshops, and interactive demonstrations. If you missed any of tonight's webinar, don't worry, we have recorded the session and it will be available on the UCD Alumni YouTube channel and the network from tomorrow. So thank you for joining us again, and we look forward to seeing you virtually and in person and at GAA matches again. Good night, everyone. Thank you, thank you Sierra. Thank, thank you all. Everyone. See you all. Bye, Cara. See you, Larry. See you, Mark. Take care. See you, Cara. Bye.